Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to part one of Clarifying Catholicism's series on the Ecumenical Councils. My name is Will Dethridge. I'll be guiding you through this series. And before we get into the actual councils themselves, I figured I'd take some time to explain, well, what exactly is an ecumenical council? Now, much of the information that I'll be presenting today is from this nifty book right here. The Ecumenical Councils of the Catholic Church, A History by Joseph Kelly. It's fantastic. It's not too dense. It's great for anyone who wants a good intro to the Ecumenical Councils, so I highly recommend it. I'll be referencing it throughout this series. So what exactly is an Ecumenical Council? What do they do? Where are they held? Who exactly leads them? What do they taste like? Hopefully, throughout this first episode, we'll be able to address some of these key questions. A church council is basically a gathering of officials in the church when they are addressing either an event or a disputed teaching of sorts. They can happen at your local level, they can happen at the regional level, but an ecumenical council, specifically as Kelly describes it, is a gathering of bishops of the entire world under the presidency of the Pope, or more likely on a day-to-day -day basis, one or more papal representatives. So as you will soon see, this is a more modern definition of the term. In short, an ecumenical council is a gathering of bishops and or their representatives from all over the world coming together in one time and one place to discuss some sort of usually disputed issue. The common misconception among a lot of uh, critics of the church are that these councils serve as a consolidation of power for its own sake. But as you'll see throughout this series, councils are usually only called when there is an external force or power that the church believes poses an existential threat to its teachings or the life of its members. So who exactly gets to call and run a council? Well, that's actually something that's changed throughout history. Today, Catholics recognize the Pope as the single most powerful authority in the church in matters of doctrine and teaching. So ordinarily we'd expect a, a pope to be the one to call a council. And in the modern period, that has been the case. But for most of human history, that's not actually how it worked. Monarchs actually ran the first eight councils. The King of France forced Pope Clement V to call the Council of Vienne in 1311. Uh, several monarchs actually forced three competing popes to uh, obey the Council of Constance in 1414. We'll get to that later. But the point is there hasn't been one single consistent authority who has decided, you know, we're gonna have a council now. In terms of attendance, that has also varied at different points throughout history. Constantinople IV in 869 was only attended by a dozen people at a certain point, whereas at its peak session, Vatican II was attended by a whopping 2,540 people. How long do they last? That is also something that has changed throughout history. Lateran IV only met for three sessions in November of 1215. Lateran V met for five years. The Council of Trent, since it was disrupted by politics and warfare, had to meet over the course of 18 years. It lasted over five papacies. So again, as we'll see throughout this series, there aren't really many static rules about how precisely councils need to be governed. How many councils were there? Now this is a hugely disputed question throughout all of Christianity. There hadn't been a set list of church councils that was considered official until the theologian Robert Bellarmine drew one up in 1612. It was approved by Pope Paul V, and today uh, the Catholic Church recognizes 21 ecumenical councils. The Orthodox Church, on the other hand, only considers the councils up through Nicaea II to be valid. And the Anglican and most Lutheran churches usually only accept uh, up to Chalcedon, so just the very first church councils that laid out things like the Nicene Creed. Another question that many critics of the church in general point out is, well, what authority do we have to even call these councils to begin with? Well, we humans have been given the immeasurable task of not only learning about a God who is infinitely beyond our comprehension, but by abiding by certain moral laws that he has given us as well through Jesus Christ. Now, it's a pretty tall task when God incarnate, the epitome of wisdom and knowledge, uh, hands these teachings down to his apostles and expects us to understand them, but then apply them to different situations throughout all of human history. And it's for this reason that the Catholic Church believes that 
Christ chose a group of 12 apostles to be the premier authorities in matters of faith and morals. In Matthew 16, Jesus speaks to the apostles saying, and I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now this power of binding and loosening that the Catholic Church believes Christ gave to Peter is the basis for the justification that church authorities, specifically the successors of the apostles, have the divine right to uh, settle matters of faith and morals. Binding and loosening actually has its roots in Jewish law, when leaders could determine what daily activities were permitted and what was forbidden. The Catholic Church believes that Jesus Christ's teachings aren't just for memorization, but they are meant to inform our decisions on a daily basis. And since Christ gave the gift of the Holy Spirit to his apostles, and they passed that along to their successors, as we can read in the epistles, it means that Jesus Christ gave us formal authorities to guide us along our journeys to relationship with him. Properly speaking, the church doesn't teach new doctrines by pulling them out of a hat or anything like that. Rather, it expresses Jesus Christ's teachings in appropriate language and applies them to new situations. It could be comparable to the American Constitution's Necessary and Proper Clause, which gives Congress the ability to make any laws that are necessary and proper to carry out and protect the Constitution. But in the church's case, we have the Word of God, and we have the church that stands as an authority to protect it, to apply it, and to teach it. Next episode will cover a few smaller councils in the early church tradition which aren't considered to be properly ecumenical, but are still important in how we understand the development of ecumenical councils. Thank you very much for watching this first episode of Clarifying Catholicism's series on the ecumenical councils. We hope you have a great day. God bless you.